Okay. Um, good morning or good afternoon for uh, everyone for you in, uh, in Africa. Assalamu alaikum if you are uh, with us. It's my great pleasure to have um, uh, this meeting along with all the friends from Africa for the first Diabetes and Ramadan event. Uh, I'm delighted that we have a very rich faculty for today and I'm delighted to have the introduction with my friend, um, Dr. John Manguero, the, the president for the IDF uh, region. Uh, John, welcome on board. Good afternoon, good morning, good uh, evening to everyone in the meeting here. Diabetes and Ramadan and what we are looking at guidelines and uh, definitely this is an important topic because most of our patients really have been in trouble because they don't know how to use their insulin during, uh, during the fasting period, the nutrition, what they should eat, what and, uh, while fasting, the do's and don'ts, and to make life uh, their life very uncomfortable during fasting so that we do not have uh, untoward effects of the fasting in our diabetes patients. And we have a group with a special relationship in this group because we have uh, underlying conditions and also we bring after. So let me introduce the program uh, for everyone. Today we have we yes. start with the uh, IDF uh, and DAR work for the dissemination of the guidelines. We're delighted to have this workshop, uh, which is supported by Sanofi and Sevier. And we're delighted to have a, a short video introduction by Professor Andrew Bolton, the president of the IDF, as well as uh, Professor Akhtar Hussein, the chair elect for the IDF region. So um, I would ask the organizers to pl please play the video message sent to us by Professor Andrew Bolton. Hello, and it's uh, my great pleasure to welcome you to this workshop on diabetes and Ramadan. My name is Andrew Bolton, uh, President of the International Diabetes Federation, and I'm delighted to say that I've been involved with this project really from its inception. Uh, the first international meeting of the Diabetes and Ramadan group was held here in my city of Manchester at the Islamic Heritage Centre of the UK back in 2013 when I addressed that meeting as President of the European Association for the Study of Diabetes. But since 2016, International Diabetes Federation has worked very closely with the Diabetes and Ramadan International Alliance to deliver comprehensive guidelines on diabetes and Ramadan. These are designed to help healthcare professionals advise and support those living with diabetes who wish to fast during the holy month of Ramadan. Patient education is, of course, critical to managing diabetes during this period. Educational needs need to be delivered in advance, so today's workshop is indeed timely. Providing education before Ramadan allows for any questions and concerns to be raised and addressed. These guidelines are, of course, of global relevance. We believe that there are probably around 500 million people living with diabetes across the world today. And this figure is set, sadly, to rise. The dramatic rise will be seen in many areas of the world with large Muslim populations, including some of our regions, Sub-Saharan Africa, Southeast Asia, and the Middle East and North African region. Because a large number of people choose to fast during Ramadan, there is a significant need for coherence and evidence-based practical guidance to help them and the healthcare professionals who support them to ensure a safe and healthy fast. As healthcare professionals, we need to understand the potential risks involved in fasting for those under our care. And we need to be well informed so we can deliver the latest evidence-based guidance on medication, glucose monitoring, nutrition and exercise during this period. This second edition of the International Diabetes Federation and Diabetes and Ramadan Practical Guidelines aims to address these needs by providing the healthcare professionals across the world with latest evidence-based uh, recommendations. It is my sincere hope and the sincere hope of all of us at IDF that these will contribute to supporting people with diabetes to safely 
and successfully participate in Ramadan, should they choose so to do. On behalf of IDF, I really wish to thank my good friend and colleague, Mohammed Hassidan from the United Arab Emirates, for his tireless work throughout these years and in the editing of the guidelines and the distinguished team that he has gathered with him. I should also like to mention my friend and president-elect, uh, Professor Akhtar Hussein, for his work done in overseeing this project on behalf of IDF. Naturally, none of this could occur without our friends and partners in both Sanofi and Serbia for their generous support in making this possible. And of course, I wish to thank you, the participants, for taking part in today's online workshop. Thank you. I'm Professor Akhtar Hussain, President-elect of the International Diabetes Federation and Chair of the IDF Working Group on Diabetes Education. It is my great pleasure to welcome you all to this workshop. Fasting during Ramadan is very important practice for millions of Muslims around the world, but can have a major impact on the management of diabetes. While evidence is limited, some studies clearly show that many people living with diabetes choose to fast. The epidemiology of diabetes in Ramadan, APDIR study performed in 2010-1, found that about 43% of people with type 1 diabetes, and about 79% of those with type 2 diabetes fasted for at least 15 days during Ramadan. Similarly, the 2010 CREED study reported that close to 95% participants with type 2 diabetes fasted for at least 15 days, and approaching about 65% fasted during the whole month of Holy Ramadan. So we know that people with diabetes will want to fast. However, we also know that an estimated one in three people with diabetes do not receive the education they need to fast safely. We are here today to help address the shortfall. I'm pleased to report that research on diabetes and Ramadan has increased tremendously over the past five years. However, there are still areas where further research will require to improve our understanding and answer some key questions. This can be what, for example, the most effective methods of providing Ramadan-focused education in different populations. What are the best possible nutrition plans for people with diabetes seeking to fast during Ramadan? And how can this be adapted for different regions across the world, will advances in treatments and technologies help bring us closer to safe management while fasting? For people on insulin therapy who fast during Ramadan, what is the most appropriate type of regimen of insulin? I think we all can agree that diabetes self-management education and support is essential for safe fasting Ramadan. For this reason, the International Diabetes Federation and Diabetes Ramadan International Alliance have come together to raise awareness of the risks associated with diabetes and fasting and deliver the best available advice for health professionals. And this is why we are making the content available to the global diabetes community. In follow-up to the latest guidance you will hear today, we recommend you to visit IDF School of Diabetes website to learn more and access a dedicated free course on diabetes and Ramadan. Thank you all, and I wish you a very successful workshop. Thank, many thanks for the president and the president-elect of the IDF for their kind introduction for the workshop. As I mentioned, today we have a rich program. The first session is the IDF Darun workshop. And then, which is, as I mentioned earlier, sponsored by Sanofi and Servier. And then the second part will be some clinical cases for the program Train the Trainer, which is supported by Sanofi. I'm delighted to have a, a very rich faculty with me um, for this program. We have uh, Dr. Khadija Hafid, a very good friend of mine working with us. Um, we work together in the same place and she's from Tanzania. We have uh, Dr. Ibrahim Jizawa from Nigeria. We have Dr. N uh, Nazir uh, Ahmed Mohammed from South Africa. And um, uh, 
uh, that will every one of us will present one case and then we'll have a panel discussion. Um, and I would like to ask Dr. Khadija to join me for the um, welcoming everyone for the program. Salam alaikum. Good afternoon and good evening. It gives me a real great pleasure to be part of this uh, program. And um, it's an honor to be working with Professor Mohammed Hassanein, who has tirelessly um, worked to get this program um, on, onto fruition. Um, we've worked closely together to make sure that we can also uh, reach out to other healthcare providers in, um, in Africa. And so today, having put together this esteemed faculty, um, I would like to um, welcome Professor Hassanein to give us the first uh, talk. Um, and he's going to elaborate on the new changes um, that have occurred with the updated uh, guidelines and the risk scoring system. So, Mohammed, the floor is yours. So now for the first session of the IDF DAR workshop uh, regarding the benefits and the risks of fasting, the risk scoring, and the pre-Ramadan assessment. So as, as we start, I would like to acknowledge the co-authors of, of these um, relevant chapters, as this discussion covers three chapters from the IDF DAR guidelines. Of course, you can download all the guidelines through the website of IDF or DAR. We all know that Ramadan, from a religious perspective, for Muslims, it's really quite an important month. It's a holy month where the Quran was revealed to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we also know that Muslims are deeply passionate about fasting Ramadan as one of the main five pillars of Islam. And fasting indeed um, is a social as well as a religious aspect. So consequently, for people during the month of Ramadan, whether they are fasting or not, they are waiting for it and they engage in many good deeds during the month of Ramadan. But we also need to try to remember the Quran itself, as well as the teaching of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, allow many people to be exempt from fasting because of illness. And the question really for us is, how can we... So again, Ramadan is an important spiritual aspect for people where good deeds are done, the socializing and the mental well-being during the month in, for many people improve. But we should remember also the mental well-being for some could be an increased level of stress or anxiety because of their inability to fast. In general, fasting the month of Ramadan is associated with reduction in weight, as we saw in the recent studies over the last five years or so, improvement in glycemic control, lipids and blood pressure, and obviously, all of this could translate into improvements in people with fatty liver disease, although the data here are quite thin. Unfortunately, the vast majority of the physical benefits during the month of Ramadan are not sustained for a long time, as we go back to our normal eating habits and lifestyle. But it is not just about benefits. For some Fasting Ramadan could be associated with risks. Hypoglycemia, or indeed hyperglycemia, that could be associated with ketoacidosis, as well as the potentials for dehydration and the theoretical risk of thrombosis in people who might be um, dehydrated and hypoglycemic, which both can increase the risk of thrombosis. So in the previous guidelines, we saw the classic tables of red, amber, and green with specific items or group of people within each level. Um, and this was a cause of um, perhaps apprehension by some because they felt that it's a bit too rigid. After all, we are all in general advising of injurization of care. And when you do the risk stratification for a person during Ramadan, you take into account a large number of, of, of aspects. There are Ramadan-related factors, diabetes-related factors, and of course, there are factors concerning the individual um, himself or herself. Many of these items really could 
vary from a person to person. And I will try to dissect some of these factors together during our presentation. So when you look, for example, into geographical differences, does it matter whether the temperature is hotter or colder? Does it matter when the fasting hours are longer or shorter? Does it matter whether the environment is accommodating for Ramadan or not? Many of these items were evident in the Orion study, which is a study that was done in 493 persons looking into um, observation of large in 300 and fasting Ramadan. The vast majority, as you can see, were from the Middle East and North Africa region, including as well as India and Pakistan. The, but there was a small number from 25 persons from Canada. However, the Canadian subgroup, six of them had hypoglycemia, which is almost a quarter of the group, wherein the others, only seven had hypoglycemia out of 477. So clearly, there is big different variation, perhaps related to the aspects of where are you. Another important factor is the type of diabetes. When you look into how many people decide not to fast because of their concern on their health, 30% in type 1 diabetes and 16% in type 2 diabetes were noted in the latest global survey we did last year. And with this, we also realized the differences in hypoglycemic episodes. 62% of type 1 diabetes who fasted had hypoglycemia, while only 15.7% of type 2 diabetes had hypoglycemia. Perhaps the differences are not in the severity of the hypos leading to hospitalization because the differences were 6.6 .6 versus 5.9, so it's not such an obvious difference as we saw in the daytime hypoglycemia. But also the difference is clear here on how many were able to fast the 30 days. 62% in type 2 diabetes are able to fast the full month, while only 27% are able to fast um, the full month in Ramadan with type 1 diabetes. But that is important for us to remember because it is more or less is the glass half empty or half full. So I can simply say to you that 30% of people with type 1 diabetes did not fast. But on the other hand, I can say to you, 27% of type 1 fasted the full month with no hypoglycemia. So it is clear to me that not all people with type 1 can fast and not all people with type 2 diabetes can fast. There are many who are unable and it varies based on a number of factors which we need to consider when we do our risk scoring. In type 2 diabetes, the variations in therapy is quite big from oral therapy to oral therapy with insulin to insulin only. And indeed for oral therapy, some of it includes sulfonylurea and some of it does not include sulfonylurea. And that means that we need to think of the type of therapy and within not just the class, within what within the class that is causing the hypoglycemia. Another very important factor is the individual own risk of having hypoglycemia. In the Crete study, we saw that in people who before Ramadan are getting hypoglycemia, they are the people who have very significant rate of hypoglycemia during fasting, even higher than that that was related to are you on insulin or not, or geography, or any of the other parameters. So if you see next day in your clinic, a Muslim person who currently out of Ramadan is having frequent hypoglycemia, that is the type of person that you need to be concerned about because of their probabilities of hypos during fasting. Taking into account the comorbidities. So here in this particular trial, which we did in Dubai, we looked into people with, chronic, with ischemic heart disease, cardiac um, heart disease. And you, you see here clearly that many people, their glycemic control worsened by the fact that they had more hypers. But some, there were improvement, 
and others it was more or less the same. Despite in our trial, we were providing them with optimum care, including patient education, the best available insulin, and flash glucose monitoring. So yes, we did not see worsening of cardiac events, but we saw worsening of hypoglycemia. What about age? Should an older person be considered as a higher risk? Well, we need to think of this and look into the parameters of the older person. After all, the older people have longer duration of diabetes. More of them are automatically decided, deciding not to fast, double or even more than double the rate of people with type 2 diabetes. And indeed, the hypoglycemia rates that leads to hospitalization is a lot higher than the younger generation. 12% versus 5% in people with type 2 diabetes when we saw the survey. So because of all this, we have developed the risk stratification. And you can go into the log to the website of the IDF or of DAR, and you can see the different items. All of these items will be available for you so that you can consider the type, the duration of diabetes, the frequency and the severity and the awareness of hypoglycemia the level of glycemic control, the type of therapy the person is on, the presence or the absence of cardio or renal problems, the presence, the recent presence of acute diabetes complications, pregnancy and pregnancy within target. Now, before I proceed with pregnancy, it's important for all to remember, a pregnant and a breastfeeding woman already has the right not to fast, regardless of whether they're diabetic or not. But one other important factor here is monitoring. Monitoring is crucial, and whether the person is monitoring appropriately or not is a risk parameter. And of course, the fasting hours are important, as well as the intensity of the job of the person and the men mental um, ability, as well as the physical ability of the person. Age only comes into consideration if the person is above 70 years and living on their own. And finally, the own experience of the person from the previous Ramadan, whether it was a negative one or um, no negative experience. And with all this, you put a score. And if the score is up to three, they are low risk. If 3.5 to six, they are moderate risk. Above six, they are high risk. And of course, you want harmony with the religious opinion, and we are delighted to have the opinion of the Mufti of Egypt, who are academics from the Azhar University, and they have taken into consideration two important principles, avoiding hardship and eliminating the potential of harm. After all, the Quran and the teaching of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, are full of examples to advise every human being not to put his health or his life into jeopardy, and indeed to use the options that we have. So with this, we have the low risk level where fasting is allowed and obligatory, and deviation for this would be based on the medical advice that the person needs to take food or drink or medication on a regular basis. Red is above six, and here the advice is against fasting. Amber, it is when you need to consider more in-depth analysis of the health of the individual, whether they have health issues or not, whether they are monitoring or not, and with all of this, they can fast if they wish to do so. But if after consultation with you, it was felt that they need to avoid fasting, then this is also allowed. If they decided to fast, they must follow the medical recommendations, including regular monitoring. So you need to assess your patient in advance, put all the risk factors to, um, and, and score them, come with a preliminary score, and potentially then you will be able to think of how can you modify some of the risk factors so that the score can be the final realistic score. If I'm not monitoring, maybe I would monitor more appropriately. Changing in medication, changing in glycemic control, even changing in the um, 
the health status of the person or the social circumstances of the person could help to change the score. I hope that very soon you will have this as an application on the website of DAR as well as on the app of DAR. So it's very important that we assess that every individual before Ramadan, we look into the detailed medical history thoroughly because you, can, you will be making an important decision for this individual. And that needs a thorough assessment. You have to look into all of the aspects that we considered, empower your patient with the timing and the frequency of monitoring, when to break the fast, when to exercise, as well as all the fluid and, 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 and eat, eating patterns. Education is key, not just for us as healthcare professionals as we are doing now, but you also need to think of the general public, specifically community leaders, the media people, and the religious community, who are very important. Because if they're saying an advice that is opposite to what you're doing, then probably the patient will be very confused and potentially would listen to the religious authorities. But after all, the most important target for education is our patients and their families and their caregivers. Education works and the meta-analysis are showing us that glycemic control for people who attend education in Ramadan has a positive impact. So we need to allow our patients to attend for education and perhaps the education in this time with COVID could be virtual to look into the risk of fasting, the modification of treatment, the monitoring, the nutrition, the physical activity, the overall management of the individual and the advice on when to break the fast. Monitoring is really crucial. We are not saying that every person should check seven times, but we are saying that we need a comprehensive approach. The frequency and the timing will vary according to all the parameters that you have decided. So this will be an important aspect. But don't forget that late afternoon to Maghrib time to evening time is the time with the highest rates of hypoglycemia. So regular checking there can prevent the hypos or can allow the person to break the fast if they are hypoglycemic. And of course, will empower them with information to those adjust. But it's, it's an opportunity as well to let the people with diabetes remember what are the symptoms of hypo and hyperglycemia. If they feel these symptoms, even without checking, they need to stop the fast. Of course, stopping the fast when a person is during acute illness is uh, standard advice. Education could be in a different format as well. And you will see that we have with the IDF and the collaboration of DAR a module that people, healthcare professionals can log in and can answer, which will provide very excellent information. And indeed, you can have information, as I mentioned, through the DAR application or the website. So in summary, Fasting during the month of Ramadan is a religious obligation for all healthy adults. However, the Islamic regulations include plenty of exemptions that include a person with illness. We as physicians and healthcare professionals need to quantify for the risks and stratify every single individual according to the different clinical parameters. With the correct guidance, many people will be able to fast safely. But if they do so, they need to be under close supervision and be aware of all the risks. The guidelines, with the new guidelines, are providing us with a unique risk certification that has the agreement of the Mufti of Egypt, which is one of the highest religious authorities in a modest country such as Egypt. Individuals who fast against medical advice need to be listening to the expert advice and trying to apply them as much as possible. And of course, pre-Ramadan assessment and education is an essential tool. I hope you benefit from this um, presentation and will, I look forward to your questions and answers later. So once again, Dr. Hassanin, thank you so much for that great introduction and comprehensive overview on the latest updates. Uh, in the guideline for fasting in Ramadan.
So I would like to introduce um, our next uh, speaker for the day, and it's uh, Dr. Ibrahim Gezawa, who's an Associate Professor of Medicine at the Department of Medicine and College of Health Sciences at Bayero University, Kanu. He's also an honorary consultant physician and endocrinologist in the Department of Medicine of the affiliate of the Aminu Kanu Teaching Hospital. He's a member of many professional uh, associations, a passionate teacher, a researcher and mentor, and has been involved in the past decade in educating healthcare professionals in guiding persons living with diabetes on how to safely fast during Ramadan. So he's gonna take us through the nuts and bolts, the practical considerations for uh, type two diabetes management with a specific focus on oral hypoglycemic agents and the GLP-1 receptor agonist. Dr. Ibrahim, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much, Dr. Khadija. Uh, I want to thank uh, Dr. Hassanin and the uh, organizers of this meeting for inviting me uh, to make this presentation. So in the next couple of minutes, I'm going to be talking about practical considerations uh, for the management of type two diabetes, uh, fasting during uh, Ramadan, focusing on the anti-diabetic agent as well as on uh, nutrition as earlier mentioned. This is to acknowledge the contribution of uh, the underlisted colleagues to the corresponding chapter in the uh, full version of the IDF DA guideline. Now, we mentioned a lot about uh, patient education and uh, pre-Ramadan uh, assessment. And as uh, Dr. Hassan mentioned, uh, we need to also educate individuals on the issue of uh, nutrition, because uh, we do know that Ramadan is associated with uh, a number of health issues and uh, many of these are due to improper uh, dietary habits, uh, which patients with type 2 diabetes fasting during Ramadan tend to indulge in. This may include the consumption of unusually large meals uh, at iftar, which may be in excess of uh, 1,500 calories. This, of course, will lead to hyperglycemia and weight gain. Another uh, improper dietary habit is uh, consumption of large amounts of highly processed carbohydrate and sugar uh, at iftar or between iftar and suhoor, that is the pre-dawn uh, meal. And then others include sugary desserts, large and frequent uh, snacks, or, you know, occasionally uh, you have uh, patients eating too quickly, which may actually lead to overeating. So all of these uh, combined will lead to hyperglycemia and weight gain during Ramadan. But apart from hyperglycemia, hypoglycemia, which is also uh, one of the feared health risks uh, during fasting, uh, can also be due to either uh, skipping of the pre-dawn meal or eating the suhoor early. Uh, normally, uh, during the Ramadan focus education, we tend to tell uh, patients that, of course, they should never skip uh, suhoor, and uh, they should delay suhoor until uh, close, very close to the beginning of the fasting period, uh, because this will avert, you know, hypoglycemia later during the fasting period, especially uh, when the fasting hours are, uh, you know, extended. Another important uh, behavioral factor that may uh, increase uh, the health risk associated with uh, Ramadan uh, is you know, changes in uh, physical activity as well as the sleeping pattern. This may actually alter uh, you know, metabolism of uh, you know, carbohydrate and may lead to uh, hyperglycemia. Now, uh, a lot has been said about pre-Ramadan assessment. And, uh, here, I'm just going to look at uh, some of the important points that we need to uh, take into consideration, especially as far as nutrition and complications of diabetes are concerned. Uh, the pre-Ramadan assessment actually, uh, you know, should seek to guide patients on medical nutrition therapy, because this will go a long way in improving glycemic control. Uh, 
the Ramadan nutrition plan is a, a, an important tool you know, in doing that uh, and it's available online. It's an online tool that uh, uh, can be used uh, you know, to guide patients in this regard. And so, uh, as I mentioned earlier on, uh, we need to educate patients on uh, the issue of gorging or overeating or compensatory eating as it were, which may all lead to uh, hyperglycemia, as we, we mentioned earlier. And then uh, during the pre-Ramadan assessment also, we need uh, to provide information to the patients on how to prevent dehydration as well as other diabetes related complications. Of course, we, we need to uh, advise the patient to take a lot of fluid, especially uh, during the non-fasting hours. And nutrition plan uh, must be individualized to the particular patient uh, in order to reduce feelings of lethargy and lack of energy. Of course, uh, Ramadan, uh, uh, provides an opportunity for patients, especially those that are overweight, to lose weight. So we need to help uh, uh, patients in this regard, you know, to advise them on how, how they could achieve uh, that goal. I'm going to talk about that uh, in this slide. So uh, what this slide shows is uh, the caloric target and ideal carbohydrate distribution for Ramadan meals. So. Uh, you will see at the uh, top left of your, your screen, uh, in males, uh, you know, depending on what we want to achieve, whether weight maintenance or weight reduction, the recommended uh, daily calorie uh, should be between uh, 1,800 to 2,200 kilocalories. While for weight reduction, uh, we need to maintain uh, the calorie intake at uh, 1,800. Uh, for females, of course, uh, it's uh, dependent on, on their height. And uh, of course, women that are taller than uh, 150 uh, cm uh, for weight maintenance will require 1,500 to 2,000 kilocalories, while for weight reduction, uh, you know, a total a daily calorie of 1,500 is recommended. Then for women who are shorter, of course, the uh, calorie daily calories also uh, less at uh, 1,500 for weight maintenance and 1,200 uh, for weight reduction. Now um, the uh, calorie should be distributed uh, uh, proportionately, uh, as you can see. Uh, for suhoor, uh, you know the percentage calorie should be 30 to 40 uh, percent, with uh, three to five exchanges with each exchange being equivalent to 15 grams of carbohydrate. Uh, for iftar, uh, snack, we need 10 to 20% in one and to two exchanges. For iftar meal, 40 to 50% in three to six exchanges. And then of course, if necessary, uh, healthy snacks can also be taken, uh, but they should constitute uh, 10 to 20% and should be in uh, one to two exchanges in order to you know, spread uh, the calories uh, evenly and to avoid uh, unnecessary postprandial hyperglycemia, which will occur. Now, the, the Ramadan nutrition uh, plate method uh, is another tool that can be used to uh, actually uh, give an estimate of the amount of calorie, uh, you know, per meal that a patient uh, will actually consume. Uh, in fact, I am aware that uh, uh, there is uh, an ongoing attempt to actually uh, improve uh, on this, uh, the nutrition plan, uh, plate method online, whereby, you know, when a patient decides on what to eat, he could just click on his plate and then, uh, and then uh, provide information on the particular meal he wants and that the uh, the software will provide the number of calories so that the patient will be able to estimate, you know, the amount of calorie that he or she is taking. So it's a very uh, important uh, trans uh, cultural Ramadan nutrition application, uh, which of course can be assessed uh, online. On this slide, you see uh, a meal that provides 500 kilocalories uh, with uh, 45% uh, constituted by carbohydrate, which of course should be uh, spread to three to four uh, exchanges 
and then 20% protein and 35% uh, fat. So this is uh, uh, a typical, uh, you know, uh, plate for uh, suhur and iftar. Now, I earlier on mentioned the Ramadan Nutrition Plan, and, uh, which is a global resource and uh, it's online. So on this, you have uh, a number of countries. Uh, for these countries, you have uh, their specific uh, menus. So what uh, you know, one needs to do is just to click on uh, their country, and then it will uh, bring out the specific menu. You know, uh, considering the cultural uh, nature of the country where one is coming from. Of course, I understand that this is uh, an ongoing thing, uh, and uh, in the future, it is uh, hoped that. Uh, menus from other different countries will be available so that uh, it will become uh, a truly global resource. Now, with uh, advances in the recognition of several additional pathophysiologic mechanisms for type 2 diabetes, uh, you know, so many uh, anti-diabetic agents are now in use, you know, for the management of type 2 diabetes. And uh, of course, as far as Ramadan is concerned, uh, the major uh, concern uh, is uh, the issue of, you know, glycemic control as well as the risk of hypoglycemia. So whenever we are prescribing uh, any of the anti-diabetic agents, these are the two factors that we need to take into consideration. Now, let's look at metformin, uh, which is one of the oldest and, and perhaps the most widely prescribed first line agent in the management of type 2 diabetes. And uh, unfortunately, not many RCTs have been conducted uh, in patient fasting during Ramadan on metformin. So, uh, but of course, from its pharmacodynamics, we know it's uh, uh, an insulin sensitizer and it is associated with uh, very low risk uh, almost no risk of severe uh, hypoglycemia. So it is a good candidate for use uh, during Ramadan. So how do you uh, adjust you know, the doses of uh, metformin in a patient fasting during Ramadan? Of course, if the, we, we have two uh, formulations of uh, metformin. You have the immediate uh, release metformin and the modified release or prolonged release metformin. So for patients on once daily dosing of immediate release metformin, usually no dose uh, modification is required and uh, the dose should be taken at iftar. For those on twice daily, uh, again, no dose modification is required, uh, but the doses should be taken at iftar and at suhur. Uh, patients on three times daily dosing, uh, in them the morning dose should be taken before the pre-down meal or the suhur. Uh, while the uh, afternoon dose is combined with the dose taken at uh, iftar. For prolonged release metformin, uh, usually no dose modification is usually required and uh, the drug should be taken at iftar. Now, acarbose is another agent that is uh, widely used and uh, it is uh, well uh, associated with uh, lower uh, risk of hypoglycemia than many other other agents, and, uh, but uh, of course it has lower efficacy than uh, compared with metformin. And a major limitation for its use is the GIT, the gastrointestinal side effects that is associated with it, especially uh, flatulence. And uh, again, just like metformin, uh, not many uh, randomized control trials have been conducted on alcohols in people that are fasting during Ramadan. So, but uh, all the same, if a patient is on, on this agent, then no dose modification is actually considered necessary. Not, it's not associated with uh, risk of hypoglycemia. Now, the thiazolidine dions are another group of agents and among them, the most uh, widely approved for the management of type two diabetes, of course, is pyoglitazone. Uh, you know, although there are limited data on uh, the use of bioglitazone uh, during Ramadan, but we do know that it is uh, associated with low risk of hypoglycemia, and uh, we presume that there wouldn't be any dose modification that is required. Uh, 
Now, uh, one study that involved about 86 uh, participants that were fasting during Ramadan and uh, taking uh, bioglitazone uh, compared this agent with uh, placebo as add-on to background of metformin. And what the uh, researchers found was that, of course, uh, bioglitazone improved glycemic control uh, and both in the early, mid, as well as uh, post-Ramadan period. And it was also associated with lower risk of hypoglycemia. However, uh, the use of pyoglitazone was associated with a significant uh, you know, increase in weight of about 3 kg uh, compared to a, a non-significant decrease in weight in the placebo group. Now, a word of conscience uh, concerning the use of uh, pyoglitazone is the fact that uh, it should not be started uh, close to Ramadan. Because uh, we do know that uh, you know uh, it takes close to uh, three months for pyoglitazone to actually establish its full uh, antihyperglycemic effect. So it should be prescribed long before uh, Ramadan. So the DPP for uh, inhibitors. Okay, excuse me. Sorry, let's now look at the short-acting insulin secretor box. Yeah, we are talking about uh, the hosprandia glucose regulators like uh, repaglinide and, uh, and uh, nateglinide. Of course, repaglinide uh, you know, is given up to three times uh, daily. And uh, uh, so if, of course, it is used in the management of uh, diabetes in patients that are fasting, uh, of course, uh, it should be uh, reduced or redistributed to two doses uh, during Ramadan, uh, according to the meal sizes of the patient. And of course, because it has a very low risk of hypoglycemia, no dose modification is usually required during Ramadan. Now, uh, the, the DPP-4 inhibitors, uh, we have many that are currently available and uh, like many other uh, anti-diabetics, of course, DPP-4 inhibitors are associated with lower risk of hypoglycemia, and uh, ordinarily, they do not require treatment modifications. There are uh, several uh, studies that have been conducted uh, with uh, DPP-4 used during Ramadan. Uh, one of the RCTs uh, that was conducted uh, by Hassan and colleagues in 2014 that involved uh, 557 participants from uh, several countries, including the Middle East, Europe, and Asia. Uh, Vilda gliptin was used and uh, uh, compared with uh, sulfonylurea as add-on to metformin. And what was found was that uh, there were fewer hypoglycemic events uh, within the Vilda gliptin group compared with the uh, sulfonylurea group. In this case, uh, glycolazide was used. And of course, there were no significant differences in glycemic control and weight changes uh, between the two groups. So indicating that uh, both uh, bildagliptin and pyoglitazone are, are effective in uh, uh, lowering uh, blood glucose in the setting of Ramadan, and they do not cause any significant uh, weight changes. So again, uh, Sulfonylureas in another study were uh, compared, uh, you know, uh, taking into consideration the fact that you know the risk of hypoglycemia with sulfonylureas actually varies between agents. So they were compared uh, in, in this study by Arabind and colleagues in 2011, and uh, in this study, uh, almost uh, 1,378 uh, participants. Uh, uh, were involved, and uh, uh, so the sulfonylureas were used as uh, add-on to metformin. So, and at the end of the day, of course, uh, what the researchers found was that uh, glycolazide was uh, associated with uh, fewer hypoglycemic events compared with the other uh, sulfonylureas. So again, talking about sulfonylureas, uh, we mentioned earlier on where DPP-4 was uh, compared with glycolazide. Now, uh, another study uh, fairly recent by Hassan and colleagues, you know, 
uh, use uh, glycolazide modified release in uh, 1,214 patients. It was a real world observational trial uh, with uh, many countries uh, involved. Uh, so uh, glycolazide modified release was uh, used uh, uh, plus minus other uh, oral anti-diabetic agent or even uh, glymepiride. So uh, what they found was that the uh, risk of uh, hypoglycemia was, uh, you know, uh, higher with other uh, sulfonylureas compared with uh, glycolazide, and uh, and so, and uh, uh, of course, in terms of uh, glycemic control, also uh, glycemic levels were, you know, lower in, uh, with uh, glycolazide compared with the other agents. Uh, body weight, uh, we are seen also to decrease by about half uh, a kilogram uh, in the glycolazide MR uh, group compared with uh, the other sulfonylureas. Now, so if sulfonylureas are being used, the following guidance uh, uh, should be followed. So if a patient is on once daily dosing, uh, that dose should be taken at IFTAR. Uh, but in individuals that are well controlled, blood glucose levels uh, with well-controlled blood glucose level, the dose may actually be reduced. In those on twice daily, uh, the IFTAR dose should remain the same, but in those that are well-controlled, uh, the SUHUR doses should be reduced. Uh, older drugs in the sulfonylurea class are actually not recommended because of the uh, high risk of hypoglycemia that is associated with them. Now, the sodium uh, glucose transporter 2 inhibitors are other uh, uh, very uh, important uh, anti diabetic agents that uh, uh, have actually uh, been used for some time now. And uh, they've uh, demonstrated effective improvements in glycemic control as well as uh, weight loss. Uh, they are also associated with low risk of hypoglycemia. And of course, uh, are likely to be safe to be used in the during Ramadan. However, uh, the major concern with the SGLT2 inhibitors is the increased risk of dehydration. So there are several studies, of course, uh, have been carried out uh, with uh, the SGLT2 uh, inhibitors during Ramadan. And of course, uh, uh, most of those the studies uh, showed, uh, you know, favorable uh, outcome. Uh, but as I said, the major limitation is the uh, the risk of hypo and uh, the risk of uh, dehydration, especially when Ramadan is undertaken in a hot uh, climate. So again, uh, what are the recommendations for the SGLT2 inhibitors? We mentioned the low risk of hypoglycemia, and so uh, ordinarily they do not need any dose adjustment. And uh, for stabilization, SGLT2 should be initiated at least two weeks to one month prior to Ramadan. Uh, this is uh, very important, uh, you know, that uh, SGLT2 uh, inhibitors should not be uh, started close to Ramadan uh, and that they should actually uh, be commenced long before Ramadan so that the patient will be stabilized uh, on these agents before uh, embarking on Ramadan fast. And it's also recommended that the SGLT2 inhibitors be administered at the evening meal as during iftar. Patients should be advised to increase fluid intake during the non-fasting hours of Ramadan to avoid uh, dehydration. And it's also important to mention here that uh, patients who are elderly or those on diuretics, uh, you know, should uh, be cautious in uh, using SGLT2 inhibitors because of the risk of uh, augmented risk of dehydration, as we have mentioned. So again, there is need to raise awareness among physicians about recent guideline changes and the benefits of new antihyperglycemic agents. And uh, when we are choosing antihyperglycemic therapy, the impact on heart failure and renal function must be considered. And uh, the SGLT2 inhibitors, uh, when fasting during Ramadan, you know, their use should be in accordance with usual safety and prescribing measures. Uh, 
Now let's talk about the GLP-1 receptor agonists. Again, these are agents that, uh, you know, in, in terms of their uh, pharmacodynamics, they actually work in a glucose dependent manner. And so uh, uh, severe hyperglycemia with this agent is actually uh, rare. However, if uh, they are combined with uh, other agents, particularly the insulin secretor box, uh, sulfonylureas, of course, the risk of uh, uh, hypoglycemia is uh, increased significantly. There are uh, a few studies that have been conducted uh, on uh, the use of GLP-1 receptor agonists during uh, Ramadan fast. And uh, one of them, of course, is the, uh, the Elixaram study, which was an open label randomized uh, study uh, involving 184 participants uh, with uh, insufficiently controlled type 2 diabetes who intended to actually fast during Ramadan. So uh, what the uh, researchers found was that lixenetide as add-on to basal insulin, so sulfonylurea, with either basal insulin and one oral glucose lowering agent, uh, there were fewer symptomatic uh, hypoglycemic events in the lixenetide uh, group compared with the sulfonylurea group. Another uh, GLP-1 receptor agonist that have been studied uh, in patients fasting during Ramadan, of course, is uh, liraglutide. So uh, in the uh, Lira Ramadan study that was conducted in Africa and Asia, uh, you know, which was uh, a randomized study in which uh, participants were switched to either liraglutide or to continue uh, sulfonylurea, both as add-on to metformin. So the primary endpoint there was change in fructose amine, uh, which gives uh, uh, us an uh, account of intermediate you know, glycemic control. So the change in fructose amine from the beginning to the end of Ramadan was the primary endpoint. So what the, uh, at, what the uh, researchers found was that there were similar uh, fructose amine uh, reduction in both the liraglutide as well as the uh, the sulfonylurea urea arm. And then in this same study also, you know, there are better weight control and fewer hypo episodes in the liraglutide group compared with the sulfonylurea group. So, uh, but the only thing about GLP-1 receptor agonists is that we have newer agents uh, such as dulaglutide, albiglutide, which have not been uh, studied well in persons uh, fasting during Ramadan with type two diabetes. So uh, as far as the uh, adjustments in, in dosages uh, is concerned, uh, because of the risk, uh, the low risk of hypoglycemia with GLP-1 receptor agonists, uh, of course, uh, they can actually, they are good candidates for use in Ramadan. However, uh, their use actually uh, should not be immediately or close to Ramadan. Uh, you know, we need to dose titrate uh, the GLP-1 receptor agonist long before Ramadan, uh, before you know the patient is now uh, can now continue on this uh, particular agent. And generally speaking, no further treatment modifications are required when we are using GLP-1 receptor agonist during Ramadan. So let's now look at uh, patients on multiple anti-diabetic therapy. Of course, with the availability of several anti-diabetic medications. Uh, of course, patients are, are now increasingly being on multiple uh, medications uh, during Ramadan. So what are the recommendations? Of course, individuals that are on uh, two or three uh, anti-diabetic agents who fast during Ramadan should receive counseling and comprehensive advice on diet, lifestyle, and drug modification uh, to avoid any uh, diabetes-related complications during Ramadan. Uh, newer technologies that include uh, continuous glucose monitoring and activity monitoring need to be harnessed through artificial intelligence to reduce the risk of hypoglycemia in people with diabetes that are on multiple anti-diabetic agents and those that are fast during Ramadan. So in summary, the uh, Ramadan uh, nutrition plan is a web-based application that is designed to help healthcare uh, providers individualize and uh, implement you know, uh, MNT, uh, medical nutrition therapy in people with diabetes that fast during Ramadan. It also helps individuals that do not have access to healthcare providers to construct a healthy eating plan. 
And we mentioned the advantages and disadvantages of various treatment options in patients fasting during Ramadan. Uh, individuals that are taking metformin, sulfonylureas, and uh, their other insulin secretables will need to make those adjustments to reduce the risk of hypoglycemia. Those on multiple anti-diabetic therapies, uh, we should know uh, are at higher risk of hypoglycemia. Therefore, counseling is recommended in those individuals. Those reductions need to be made to accommodate for the increased risk of hypoglycemia. And then importantly, a post-Ramadan follow-up consultation is recommended to reassess treatment regimens and discuss fasting experiences during Ramadan. So with the correct advice and support from healthcare professionals, uh, most people with type 2 diabetes can fast safely during Ramadan. These are my references for this chapter. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Nizawa, for that excellent uh, presentation. And before I introduce our next speaker, I would like to remind our participants that we will be having a Q&A session um, at the end of the plenary lectures, and therefore we encourage you to use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to type in your questions and we will endeavor to address them um, at the end. So moving on then, uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our third speaker of the day, and this is Dr. Nazir Mohammed, who is a consultant endocrinologist um, at the Chris Hani Barag Wanath Academic Hospital, um, which is famous for being the largest hospital in the Southern Hemisphere. He is the past chairperson of the SEMSDA, which is the Society for Endocrinology, Metabolism and Diabetes of South Africa. And he has contributed to national diabetes and thyroid guidelines in South Africa. He has regularly conducted teaching activities on diabetes and Ramadan. And today he will be telling us all about the insulin modifications that's required for patients who are obser observing the Ramadan fast. Dr. Nazir, welcome. Assalamu alaikum and good afternoon to all. Uh, thank you to the organizers for this most kind uh, invitation to present. So I thought today we'll go through insulin modification, but it's quite a big topic to go through in 20 minutes. So I thought let's try and make it a bit more practical. Uh, so, so the questions that we try to answer in this presentation would be, is there evidence for the use of insulin during the month of Ramadan? And if we are going to use insulin, is there a difference between human insulin or insulin analogs? Is there a regimen which is best suited for Ramadan? And how do we adjust insulin doses at the start of Ramadan? And we'll go through a little bit about the titration of insulin dosing during Ramadan. We'll also try and touch on what's new in the, in the newest guidelines uh, so that we have a bit of an update on the topic. So I thought to make it a bit more practical, uh, we try and make it, uh, we'll frame it around a case. So Mrs. A, Ms. A is a 53-year-old female. She's known with type 2 diabetes for about nine years. She's on metformin and uh, human insulin mix 30. So 30% short-acting insulin and 70% uh, intermediate-acting insulin. Her insulin dose at the moment is 30 units prior to breakfast and 20 units prior to supper. Uh, her H1C is 9% and she has no recent history of hypoglycemia. She has no other target organ damage or in, uh, organ dysfunction. Uh, with normal cardiac function. Uh, she has previously fasted during Ramadan by omitting insulin. As her doctor had advised her that it was high risk to fast on insulin. Uh, and she now has changed her practitioner and comes to you. So with that in mind, I thought perhaps just a bit, a bit of a reminder to see where that insulin fit in terms of the stratification. Uh, as Dr. Hassanay mentioned in the first talk, that previously we had the red light, orange light, and green light, and insulin often tended to be moderate to high risk uh, for, for most patients. If you look at the newer uh, iteration of the guidelines, the type of insulin in itself doesn't automatically elevate you to a higher risk category. Uh, however, for this patient, she does have suboptimal baseline control. So she would be in a moderate uh, risk category. Uh, it should be borne in mind that for patients with basal insulin, the risk is lowest. And those on multiple daily mixed insulin uh, injections are at the highest risk. So she would fall into a higher risk category. So at the start of Ramadan, we have many options in terms of adjusting insulin therapy. And for this, for this reason, it's very important to individualize therapy. 
So of, amongst the options that we have, we could continue the current therapy as is. We may, the patient may require a dose adjustment of the current therapy. We may need to adjust the timing of doses. For example, you may have a patient who have, you have two patients on exactly the same dose of insulin, but the ones practicing Romeda is to have a very large suhur or morning meal that's, uh, that has rice and a very high carbohydrate load, whereas another patient may opt to just have a cup of tea uh, and a bit of fruit. So you, you may have very different modifications that are required, and that is why it's important to individualize therapy. In terms of, we may also consider changing to a different drug. So perhaps we may consider that this patient's uh, risk factor profile is too high on basal insulin, and there may be other options. Uh, so we could try and look up to some of those. We may change a different combination of drugs and try and bring in some of the more, some more of the oral drugs that uh, the previous speaker has alluded to or we could change to a different form of the current therapy, where instead of using a low ratio pre-mixed insulin, we could try and move to a 50-50 mixed insulin, where 50% will be short acting and 50% will be intermediate acting. So these are some of the options that we have for this patient. Uh, specifically, we could adjust the doses and the timing of the doses. We could consider adding a GLP-1 receptor agonist. We could consider splitting her to basal insulin uh, with gradual insulin or uh, a combination of the above. So before we proceed, I thought just a few practical considerations that we often may do a risk stratification and we may assess a patient is having a very high risk of fasting. And we may tell the patient that they should not fast. But as we, we are all well aware that for many patients, uh, the urge and the yearning to fast often uh, exceeds or overwhelms any other consideration. And therefore they will, they will fast irrespective of their risk le level as well as the advice of the physicians. For those patients who elect to fast despite appropriate advice and risk stratification, then our role as physicians probably does change, where we now need to ensure that they fast in a safer manner as possible, instead of telling them to go out and do it uh, the way you want to, and don't come back to me because you're not listening to me. Uh, the second issue is we've often considered that hypoglycemia is our main danger during the fasting period, but we should also take care that we do not have a deterioration in glycemic control. It's often found that many patients who have a deterioration in glycemic control then have, often take months thereafter to, to regain a good glycemic control. The insulin regimen must be individualized for each patient, taking into account their education, their preferences, their diet, and their lifestyle. There are some orders to recommend to make things easy for those patients on premix insulin, to change them to a long-acting uh, insulin in the evening and rapid-acting insulin with meat, meals, so sort of modified basal bolus. The problem with changing a regimen only for the month of Ramadan is that you may not have sufficient time to educate these patients appropriately, especially during the resource with the resource constraints of a busy clinic. Uh, you may then have errors, you may have non adherence and then you may actually require additional education. And uh, your patients will often revert back to their original insulin if they find that it's not working for them. Uh, then the, the last factor to consider from a practical point of view is that your patients pre Ramadan glycemic control will determine whether dose reductions are required. For that patient whose fasting glucose is 10, whose HbA1c is between above 10% and who insists on fasting, there probably is no benefit in reducing the insulin doses as they're already hypoglycemic. And the appropriate therapy, if it was not for Ramadan, would be a dose escalation, provided that they are adhering to their therapy. So let's change the track now and look at basal insulin. So in terms of basal insulin, we don't have very robust data uh, in terms of the evidence for use of, uh, uh, of basal insulin in Ramadan. We have a few observational trials, and most of them have relatively sm small numbers. The largest traditional study was the SALTI study, which compared uh, basal insulin to oral therapy prior to Ramadan, during Ramadan, and thereafter. And while there was no significant difference in uh, dysglycemia, there was an increased incidence of hypoglycemia in the Ramadan period as compared to the pre and post Ramadan periods. Uh, so based on these observational trials, we probably uh, assume that basal insulin could be used during the month of Ramadan. It should be noted that most of these trials suggested the use of insulin glargin. We now have a trial, and probably the largest observational trial to date, of glargin 300 died by uh, Professor Hassanin and his group. And they looked at 1,214 patients uh, in a real-world observational trial where patients were allowed to use any other oral agent or GLP-1 receptor agonist. And 
the, I think the take home points from this study is that the, if this trial showed a very low incidence of symptomatic hypoglycemia and no, evidence, no episodes of severe hypoglycemia during the study period. There was a very trivial change between the pre-Ramadan, post-Ramadan and uh, Ramadan periods in terms of hypoglycemia. And the other take home was, this was a trial which showed that uh, glycemic control could actually be intensified during the month of Ramadan. So these patients started with an H1C of 7.5% and then reduced to an H1C of 7.2%, which was significant. Now, in terms of how do we dose adjust basal insulin? So for those patients who are on once daily long acting insulin, so glargine or Degladec, uh, the recommendation is that they should take, the, reduce their dose if they're they at a reasonable level of control by 15 to 30% and take their dose that you've touched at. For those patients who are on twice daily uh, insulin, such as intermediate acting NPH, they should take the usual morning dose at iftar, because often the, the larger dose is in the morning, and they should then take the usual evening dose and re, uh, at suhoor, but reduce their dose by 50%. So in essence, invert their day and their night, uh, since their prandial period will now be nighttime and their fasting period will be during the day. Uh, so in terms of uh, dose adjustments, um, the recommendation is that if you are taking once daily uh, long acting insulin, this should be uh, taken at uh, once, sorry, let me just start again. If you are taking once daily long acting insulin, the recommendation is you take the dose at iftar and reduce the dose by 15 to 30%. Uh, if you are taking twice daily intermediate acting insulin, then the recommendation is that you invert your day and your night. So usually the bigger dose of intermediate acting insulin is taken in the morning and you would therefore take a bigger dose, uh, your usual morning dose at iftar, and you would then take a 50% reduction of your usual morning dose, uh, uh, evening dose at suhoor, right? Uh, in terms, so let's go back to Ms. A. If you were to decide that she could be using a GLP-1 receptor agonist, the recommendation would be to change it to a drug such as liraglutide four to six weeks prior to Ramadan and basal insulin uh, at the same time. We would then titrate the basal insulin according to her fasting glucose levels as the liraglutide dose is adjusted. So as the dose is titrated upwards, as GIT symptoms are overcome, uh, you often may require a dose reduction of your basal insulin. At the start of Ramadan, she would continue her metformin and GLP-1 receptor agonists at the usual dose, and she would reduce the basal insulin by 15 to 30% and take that dose at iftar. The, de the decision to reduce by 15 to 30% would be uh, taken up uh, depending on her fasting glucose levels. The important thing is if you are starting a patient on basal insulin, we have to educate these patients that they may, they, they, they will have to self-monitor and self-titrate their doses because it is often not feasible for them to contact the healthcare practitioner during the month for every dose titration. So the recommendations is that if a patient has any hypoglycemic episode, they should then break their fast and subsequently reduce their dose by four units. Uh, the, the recommended time of fasting in, in the patient who is not having hypoglycemia is pre-iftar. Uh, if the we should then reduce the dose, uh, if the patients are at five, between four and five, we should reduce the dose by two units, just so that we move away from risk of hypoglycemia. We should make no dose, dose adjustment if, the, if their glucose levels are between five and seven. If their glucose levels are, are elevated, we shouldn't make a dose adjustment based on a single reading. We should rather look at a trend for three to four days. And then if the majority of readings are actually elevated, we should then increase the dose by two or four units, uh, depending on the glucose levels. So another question that often comes up is, should we use analog versus human insulin? This was addressed in a small study by Akram where they compared uh, ins uh, Lispro insulin against uh, soluble human insulin. And they found that the proportion of patients having hypoglycemic episodes was similar, but uh, in, in the, for those patients who were able to fast, they did seem to be a trend that there were fewer hypoglycemic episodes on Lispro compared to soluble insulin. There were no severe episodes in the study. So prandial insulin analogs could be associated with a lower risk of postprandial hypoglycemia when compared to, to ins human insulin there may be a, 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 a lower risk of hypoglycemia. From a practical point of view, insulin analogs are injected just before a meal or just after a meal. So they can be administered at the time of iftar or suhoor instead of having to wait 30 minutes prior to the meal. 
So for that patient who often struggles to wake up in time for suhoor, uh, he may find it difficult to then inject and wait 30 minutes, or he may feel that he has now eaten and he doesn't want to inject those prangeli. Uh, analogs then offer him the option of injecting immediately at the start of the meal or even after the meal. It must be borne in mind that patients should be educated that if there is a need to inject after the start of, of the fast, this will not invalidate the fast and they are, and they are able to do so. Right? So for uh, Mrs. A is basal insulin and preangial insulin an option. So what we could do is she's currently on 35 units of basal insulin and 15 units of preangial insulin. We will then start the basal insulin uh, once in the evening, titrate it based on her fasting glucose levels. You then titrate her, her, insu her preangial insulin two hours uh, post according to a two hour post preangial blood glucose level. So Mrs. A, she started at 34 units of, she then at the time of Ramadan was now on 34 units in the morning and as part 16 units at breakfast and 14 units at supper. So during Ramadan, she would then continue the metformin at the usual dose. She would reduce glargine to 28 units now that her fasting glucose levels are between five and six. And the fact that she now required much more preangial insulin suggests that on the premix insulin, there was inadequate preangial cover. For her, we would now reduce the SPA to eight units at suhoor and continue with 14 units at iftar. Once again, it's important that uh, these patients should do, uh, be educated on self titration and self monitoring. Uh, the recommended time is two hours post suhoor. And once again, if there are any hypoglycemic episodes, there should be immediate cessation of the fast and the patient should then reduce their dose by four units. The rest of the titration model is very similar to the, the scale that we use for basal insulin. And the aim is then to keep patients in that range of five to seven. Once again, if a single day uh, has a higher glucose level, uh, that should not be acted on immediately, but rather look at a trend for a few days. Uh, so to sum up short acting insulin, the normal dose is given at iftar. We'd omit a lunchtime dose as these patients are not eating during the day and we reduce the suhuru dose by between 25 and 50%, depending on the patient's meals. Uh, the commonest insulin that we that I use uh, in many countries is premix insulin. And this is usually a low ratio premix where 25 to 30% are short or rapid acting insulin and 70 to 75% are intermediate acting insulins. So this would be your Umelogs, your Novomix, uh, your Actrophanes. The challenge with low ratio premix insulin is that they may provide inadequate prandial cover in the evening for the results in postprandial hyperglycemia. The doses of prandial insulin cannot be adjusted independently, and this leads to a risk of both postprandial hyper and hypoglycemia after suhoor. So if that patient is having a very heavy meal, uh, he may have a hypoglycemia, and for that patient who's not eating sufficient, he's unable to adjust his prandial insulin without causing a deterioration in his fasting glucose either. So the options that have been proposed is you use a higher ratio premix insulin at iftar. So this has been studied in a few studies where they've looked at uh, premix uh, 50. So where 50% is short acting and 50% intermediate acting at iftar and either a basal insulin only or the usual uh, premix 30 where 30% is short acting at iftar. And this does seem to be an, a valid option for those patients who are willing to change the regimen for the month of Ramadan. An alternate option is what you alluded to previously is you could then change the patients to either basal plus prandial, either just for the largest meal of the day or basal plus a GLP-1 receptor agonist with or without other agents. In terms of an update, we now have a trial from Hassanin et al, which looked at idec esp or Rhizodec, uh, which has 70% insulin Deglidec, an ultra long acting insulin and 30% uh, short acting or rapid acting insulin. And this trial showed that in 263 patients that it can be used safely during the month of Ramadan with a statistically lower incidence of overall hypoglycemia. And that was probably driven by a more stable long acting insulin. Uh, which showed a 74% reduction in hypoglycemia. Uh, there was a similar glucose control in terms of HB1C uh, in both arms throughout the study. So there wasn't an improvement, but there was, it does suggest that the ultra long acting insulin, both this trial as well as the Orion study, which I showed uh, earlier, both suggest that the ultra long acting insulins are probably safer in terms of hypoglycemic risk. So if we were to continue her current insulin, so she now decides that. She wants to continue the same insulin throughout Ramadan. She doesn't want to change. Uh, we continue the metformin at the current le level. Since she hasn't dose titrated, we wouldn't reduce uh, the dose by a very uh, large proportion. So she would reduce her morning dose to 24 units, but she would now take that at, at Suhoor and she would then continue with 20 units at Iftar. Uh, we may then have to monitor over the next few days to see whether or not 
uh, she then needs a further dose reduction or dose escalation. So in terms of premix insulin, it's the same titration model. If the patient is taking once daily premix insulin, as sometimes happens, they would take the normal dose at iftar. If they are taking twice daily, they would take the normal dose at iftar, but reduce the dose at suhoor by 25 to 20 to 50%. If they are taking three times daily, they would omit the afternoon dose and adjust the iftar and suhoor doses as someone who's taking twice daily uh, premix insulin. Once again, if the patient has any hypoglycemic episodes, they should uh, break the fast and have an immediate dose, uh, dose reduction. Uh, on this point, I just want to draw your attention to those patients who are on very high uh, doses of insulin. So we may sometimes have those patients who are taking in excess of 100 or 150 units of insulin. And then a, a dose adjustment of two or four units, is probably not really meaningful. So for those patients, the recommendation is that they would then make a 10 to 20% dose. So if they who are on 100 units, they will then adjust the dose by 10 units at a time and not uh, by, by two units. Right. Uh, finally, I, we just touched briefly on medical uh, insulin pump therapy during the month of Ramadan. The, the majority of these patients are patients with type 1 diabetes uh, and haven't really been covered during this, this uh, webinar. But uh, the advantage of uh, insulin pump therapy is that it allows reduction of both hypo and hyperglycemia in appropriately educated patients. So these are patients who are willing to test uh, their glucose levels frequently to, adjust, to calculate their bolus uh, doses for each meal and who are willing to adjust their basal rates uh, accordingly. Uh, a meta-analysis in the type one population, uh, unfortunately we don't have any data in the type two population uh, uh, that's re to the same extent, has showed that you, we have lower rates of severe hypoglycemia, hyperglycemia or DKA, but a higher rate of non-severe hyperglycemia than multiple daily injections. For those patients who are well-educated and have no recent history of uh, diabetic emergencies or hypoglycemia, they are able to fast. Uh, the suggestion is that they reduce their basal dose by 20 to 40% in the last three to four hours of, their fast, of the fasting period. They often are required to increase their doses after iftar by up to 20% uh, as they now enter the prandial phase of the, of the day the bolus rate remains the same where they would then have to calculate the boluses according to their usual sensitivity uh, principles. Right? Uh, the advance is now sensor augmented pumps and closed loop automated insulin delivery systems, which may reduce the risk even further. Uh, and we await trials in this, in this area. Uh, I will now finish off on, in terms of monitoring. Uh, we have to educate patients that if they are going to fast during Ramadan on insulin therapy, monitoring is essential. Depending on the complexity of the, of the, of the insulin regimen, the, the, the monitoring is probably going to be more, uh, uh, more rigorous. So for those patients who are on multi-daily -do doses of insulin, who, are on, uh, who may have had a prior history of hypoglycemia, these patients will probably need to test prior to the suhoor meal, in the mid-morning, mid mid-day, as well as mid-afternoon, uh, if there's a risk of hypoglycemia, if they see that the trend uh, from one of the readings is now heading in the wrong direction, uh, they may also be uh, required to test two hours after iftar if there's a need to titrate their insulin doses. On the other hand, for the patient who's on basal insulin, where there's and perhaps a GLP-1 receptor agonist who doesn't have any hypoglycemic episodes, he may be required to test only at the time of iftar, just prior to iftar, and perhaps once during the day just to ensure that, they, uh, that there isn't a risk of hypoglycemia at around midday. It once again must be emphasized to patients that finger prick testing does not invalidate the fast, the fast and uh, this has often been a misconception uh, in many communities. Uh, the new advance is continuous glucose monitoring and with appropriate education, this probably will re result in better glycemic control during Ramadan as your patients are able to test their glucose at multiple times uh, during the day. It must, they must however be educated that often there is a, a slight lag so if they feel that they are having hypoglycemic symptoms, they will need to do a finger prick test. And if that's not possible, they will still need to, uh, to, in, uh, to break the fast. Uh, flash CGM systems are now pr providing a more affordable option. And we now are seeing uh, where these flash CGM systems are, apply, are integrated with applied artificial intelligence and algorithms are now advising these patients on uh, how to adjust uh, insulin regimens to make fasting safer. So in summary, insulin can be used safely in appropriately selected patients. We now have evidence that the ultra long acting insulin may be used safely during the month of Ramadan and with a lower risk of hypoglycemia. The insulin therapy must be individualized for the patient considering the baseline control, education and preference. Uh, 
uh, as well as their dietary changes during the month of Ramadan. But if they are to use insulin during the month of Ramadan, it is essential that they are educated that they need to monitor and they need to self-titrate their doses so that uh, they do not have hypo or hypoglycemic uh, problems during the month. And with that, I would like to thank you. Uh, these are my references, and I would like to also acknowledge the other authors uh, on this chapter. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nazir. Very clear presentation. Now I would like to introduce my uh, colleague and friend, Dr. Khadija Hafid. Uh, Dr. Khadija is a consultant and a chronologist at Rashid Hospital. She's also an associate professor in Dubai Medical College, and she's very passionate about the topic of diabetes in Ramadan, uh, where she has been a co-author in a number of studies, including our latest IDF guidelines. The topic that uh, Dr. Khadija will cover to, um, th this afternoon is the management of hyperglycemia in special populations during Ramadan. Uh, Khadija, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Mohammed, for that very kind <clears throat> introduction. And thank you to the organizers um, for inviting me to be part of the program. So as mentioned, uh, I will now like to discuss the special populations <clears throat> that might also want to observe the Ramadan fasting. And these include pregnant women with diabetes, elderly patients with diabetes, patients with diabetes who have chronic uh, kidney disease and those with cardiovascular disease. So to fast or not to fast during Ramadan is really a personal choice that is dictated largely by religious practice and at times will require the input of the medical professions. So how does the medical fraternity um, come to use or how do we get involved in the uh, pre-Ramadan education? It is essential for us first to determine whether the individual can safely fast and whether the um, fast will not further jeopardize their health conditions. We also know that not a lot of people receive such education and therefore we want to encourage um, and make sure that we're offering um, patients that are eligible um, to, to be given the education well ahead of uh, Ramadan. An education program needs to be individualized and it should include the risks of fasting. And we've already um, heard from Dr. Hassanein the uh, new scoring method of assessing the risks for fasting for individuals with diabetes. We would then look at the treatment modifications and you've heard a bit about that from Dr. Gazawa and Dr. Nazir. Um, we need to be able to discuss on self-monitoring of blood glucose because if an individual is not able to undertake self-monitoring, then the fasting is going to be quite dangerous for them. In light of that, they will then need to be informed and know when they have to break the fast. And of course, we uh, need to also inform them about all the nutrition um, and physical activity um, changes that would need to be made specifically for Ramavan. So the risk score follows this traffic light system that you've uh, already heard where the green is for the low risk and usually that score is between zero to three. The amber is for the moderate risk. So these individuals um, can fast with some modifications but are usually not advised to. And the high risk individuals, those who score above six are the ones um, who should not fast. So let's look at the management of hyperglycemia in pregnancy. Um, when fasting during Ramadan. So pregnant and breastfeeding women have a religious right not to fast whether they have diabetes or not. And so it's important to tell our pregnant women um, that they do have this temporary exemption. The pregnant women with pre-existing diabetes or gestational diabetes are considered a high risk group for fasting during Ramadan because of the potential for adverse outcomes, both in the mother and in the unborn child. And there are multiple factors that influence the risk assessment of pregnant women with hyperglycemia, and we will carefully review some of these. So just as a reminder, we know that dysglycemia in pregnancy can result in adverse pregnancy outcomes. In the first trimester, it may lead to increased fetal malformations. And then in the second and third trimester, there may be increased risk for macrosomia and metabolic complications. <clears throat> 
So what have we learned so far? In the past five years, there have been a number of studies that have been dedicated um, and looking at the um, management of gestational diabetes during Ramadan. Some of these studies have used continuous glucose monitoring and flash glucose monitoring systems, which has provided us with quite a lot of information about the glucose changes when fasting during Ramadan. What we've seen is that there's an overall improvement um, in the blood glucose levels. However, we still see that the postprandial blood glucose levels are frequently high. Episodes of hypoglycemia were remarkably longer in duration during uh, fasting hours. Most of these episodes tended to be asymptomatic and many of them would occur during the last few hours of fasting. So despite the fact that we've seen some encouraging results, there still isn't enough evidence to change the high risk status of fasting during Ramadan for women with gestational diabetes. Important also to note that most of those studies were conducted on highly motivated volunteers in centers with very high skill of, uh, with very high levels of skill and support, including the use of continuous and flash glucose monitoring systems alongside good patient education. So the risk stratification tool, um, you've already seen this, and for pregnancy, if a pregnant lady is not within her blood glucose targets, then it's 6.5 and therefore should not be um, advised to fast. On the other hand, if they're within targets, it drops down to 3.5 and therefore it would fall in the amber category. And um, then there can be a discussion on whether they can be allowed to fast or not with the appropriate um, medical interventions. So, when we're thinking about the pre-Ramadan assessment, it's essential to be done well ahead of Ramadan. And this is an opportunity to um, risk stratify them. It's also an opportunity to talk about um, the changes to normal lifestyle that fasting can bring about and those should be emphasized. It's an opportunity to talk about self-monitoring of blood glucose. So if this is something that the, in, the woman is not already, the, uh, already doing because they have type two diabetes and they're oral, on oral hypoglycemic agents, if they are to embark on um, Ramadan fasting, this is something that has to be incorporated. And if possible, the use of continuous or flash glucose monitoring systems um, would be encouraged because we've seen that these are greatly useful um, for um, reducing both the risk of hypo and hyperglycemia. Physical activity and nutrition also needs to be discussed well ahead of Ramadan. Um, if you have the ability to send the patient to a nutritionist, this would be a great thing. Then there's the general advice about avoiding fruit juices and sugary uh, beverages and limiting the intake of both caffeine and salty foods. What about the glucose uh, target? So women must understand, pregnant women must agree that regardless of their fasting status, they need to sustain the standard blood glucose targets during uh, pregnancy. So they need to maintain their fasting levels between 70 to 95 milligrams per deciliter, which translates to about 3.5 to 5.3 millimoles per liter. And they need to maintain their postprandial blood glucose readings below 120. We also must advise them that they need to break their fast if their blood glucose levels drop to less than 70 milligrams per deciliter during the fasting hours, irrespective of whether they've got symptoms or not, at any time of the day when they're feeling unwell, or if they notice that they have reduced fetal movements. When should they test? They should be doing it regularly, um, as often um, as possible, at the least before the sunset meal, one to two hours after the meal, depending on the individual's uh, patient's routine of whether they're having two or three meals during Ramadan. And once during the day while they're fasting, particularly in the afternoon, and definitely any time of the day um, when they're feeling unwell. So what are the recommendations for those that are on insulin therapy? For those that are on insulin pumps, um, the monitoring system um, might be augmented by the use of continuous uh, glucose monitoring systems. And for those patients, the basal rate would need to be adjusted 
And the way to do it is to reduce the um, basal rate by 20 to 40% for the final three, four hours of the fast, and then to increase uh, by 10 to 30% for the initial few hours after um, of, of iftar. With the bolus doses, the same principle as prior to Ramadan, whereby they would reduce their dose post-suhur by about 20%. Now, for those patients that are on an MDI uh, basal bolus with an analog insulin regimen, the recommendations is for the basal insulin is to reduce um, the dose of the basal insulin by 30 to 40%, and it should be taken at iftar. So that's the evening meal. And for the rapid acting insulin, the dose at suhoor should also be reduced by about 30 to 50%. Because they're fasting, the pre-lunch dose is obviously going to be omitted. And the dose at iftar would be adjusted based on the two hour post iftar glucose reading. For those on a basal bolus regimen that consists of the conventional insulins, so if it's uh, NPH insulin, the morning pre-Ramadan dose should be taken at the time of iftar and it should be reduced, uh, the, the um, pre-Ramadan dose that needs to be taken at the suhoor, which is the morning meal, needs to be reduced by 50%. Then for the short-acting insulin, the dose at iftar would be adjusted based on the two-hour post-iftar glucose readings, whereas the suhoor dose would be reduced by 50% of their pre-Ramadan evening dose. And as um, with the other category, the afternoon dose would need to be skipped. We would prefer that patients on um, a basal bolus regimen would need to have at least a five to seven point glucose monitoring profile. Premixed insulins are not really encouraged, but if they need to be used, whether analog or conventional, we would just shift the morning pre-Ramadan dose to the iftar uh, time, and you would inject 50% of the pre-Ramadan evening dose at the time of suhoor. So to summarize, patient education prior to Ramadan is really important to ensure safety of both the mother and the unborn child, regardless of what the fasting decision is. Regular self-monitoring of blood glucose should be conducted at least once before the sunset meal, one to two hours after the meal, once while they're fasting and at any time of the day when they're feeling unwell. They must also understand that if they're feeling unwell or the blood glucose levels drop to below 70 or they've got a reduction in fetal movements, they must break the fast. And for those patients, as I've highlighted that are on insulin, the doses would need to be adjusted according to their insulin regimen. Let's focus now on the management of diabetes in the elderly. To start with, age alone should not be used as a risk factor for um, fasting during Ramadan. It's not a barrier. Age alone is not a barrier. The consideration for elderly people is when they have accompanying comorbidities. And we know that many elderly individuals will still fast um, during Ramadan. And here it's important um, for us to come in and make sure that they're able to observe, observe their fast safely. So what is new? We know that the prevalence of fasting in elderly individuals is much lower than in the younger um, individuals. We also know that the presence of comorbidities such as impaired renal function, cardiovascular disease, dementia, frailty, and the risk of falls um, is also more pronounced in elderly individuals. And therefore this needs to be taken into consideration in the risk stratification. The risk of diabetes related complications is also higher in elderly populations and therefore modifications to the medi uh, medications are quite essential for um, all elderly people who are wishing to fast. So um, this uh, you've already seen, uh, Dr. Hassanin already alluded to the uh, global survey that was conducted last year um, during Ramadan and um, here we've divided the patients um, below 65 and above 65. And we can see that for the patients that were above 65, they had more attendances because of hypoglycemia um, and, uh, and hospital admissions. Um, the ones who fasted um, during Ramadan tended to be um, younger than, uh, than 65. And 
the duration of uh, diabetes um, was much higher for the patients that were 65 um, and older. So looking at the risk of complications as well, for those who are 65 and above, as you can see, they have more comorbidities in terms of hypertension and dyslipidemia, and even the diabetes-related um, complications, retinopathy, uh, neuropathy, nephropathy, uh, strokes, and diabetic foot problems tend to occur more frequently in, in those that are older than 65. So what are the considerations for elderly people who are seeking to uh, fast during Ramadan? We need to think about their physical activity patterns, their ability to um, monitor their blood glucose, their ability to take their own medications, their feeding patterns outside of Ramadan and how that is going to change during Ramadan and their overall general independence. So again, looking at the risk stratification, we have to key in frailty and their cognitive function. So any elderly person who has impaired cognitive function is at a very high risk. The risk is about 6.5 here. If they are also frail, the risk is high. On the other hand, if they're above 70 years um, of age, but with no home support, but do not have any um, impairment in their uh, cognitive function and are not frail, then the risk score is in the moderate range of 3.5. On the other hand, if you have an elderly individual with no frailty or no loss of cognitive function, then their score is zero, and that individual um, might be able to fast, provided they do not have any other comorbidities, uh, other, you know, um, the hours of fasting um, are also taken in, into consideration. So the tips then for in terms of the medications, it's important to choose medications that would lower uh, and minimize the risk for hypoglycemia. So um, careful adjustments have to be made in order to reduce the risk for hypoglycemia. And as I've mentioned, they need to be able to increase the frequency of self-monitoring um, during Ramadan in order to detect hypoglycemia um, before the, they actually um, sense it. The other thing about the diet, of course, it's again going to be very individualized, but what's important is to make sure that they stay well hydrated during the non-fasting hours. Um, the nutrients uh, that are taken while they are breaking the fast should also be um, discussed with the family who is probably, um, uh, or the caretaker who's preparing um, those meals. Physical activity might need to be reduced, but it doesn't need to be completely stopped during the fasting hours. But then these activities also should be planned um, uh, ahead of time, and they should be taken into um, conjunction with the nutrition plan and the medication regimens as well. The social considerations are also important. Those uh, elderly individuals who have community support would probably do much better and um, it's also um, important to tell them about um, their own sort of personal awareness of symptoms of hypo and hyperglycemia. If they're not able to recognize that, then that is a problem. Or at least if you've got, they've got the support of the family around who would be able to recognize that um, and intervene um, appropriately, that would be a great thing. So to summarize, We've seen that lower proportions of elderly individuals fast um, when compared to the uh, younger counterparts. Diabetes-related complications such as hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia occur more frequently. Greater and more careful planning pre-Ramadan is required for elderly individuals to ensure that they're able to fast safely. There must be a greater emphasis on self-monitoring of blood glucose to ensure that um, they can observe the fast um, safely, and the use of anti-diabetic agents must be adjusted so that the risk for hypoglycemia is reduced. What about patients with chronic kidney disease and cardiovascular disease? So what we know that diabetes is a risk factor for cardiovascular disease and strokes, and individuals with pre-existing cardiovascular disease or stroke and diabetes are at a greater risk for complications when they're fasting and therefore should be cautious. Individuals with chronic uh, kidney disease of stage three and diabetes are also at high risk for fasting during Ramadan. 
And certainly those with CKD stage four to five at a, at a very high risk for fasting and should be discouraged not to undertake the fasting. So previously people with diabetes and CKD stage three were classified as high risk and those in stage four or five were classified as very high risk. In the new stratification uh, tool, both are discouraged um, from fasting. So if we look at the stratification here for a patient who has chronic complications such as unstable angina, heart failure, or the EEGFR is less than 30, we can see that the score is very high, it's 6.5. On the other hand, with an EGFR between 30 to 45, the score drops down to four. If they've got stable cardiovascular disease and the um, EGFR is between 45 to 60, the score drops down further to two. And if, got, if they have no cardiovascular disease and a normal EGFR, then the score is zero. So the recommendations for individuals with CKD, again, the assessment needs to be done well ahead of Ramavan. Individuals in stage three to five or on dialysis should be considered as very high risk and should be discouraged from fasting. For those who choose to fast, they need to be very carefully monitored and have weekly reviews during Ramavan. They must make a conscious effort to stay well hydrated outside of the fasting uh, hours they would need to monitor both the electrolytes and creatinine levels at various points during Ramadan. And they would need to avoid foods that were high in potassium or phosphorus because then this could further um, jeopardize their um, kidney function and even cause more complications. So for the macrovascular complications, the recommendations is to have a thorough risk assessment from their diabetes specialist, from the cardiologist, from the neurologist well in advance of a Ramadan. They need to have this individualized advice based on their current health status and their treatment regimens. They need to receive the pre-Ramadan education so that they uh, understand how to conduct uh, the uh, fasting safely uh, during Ramadan. They need to make appropriate, uh, uh, appropriate adjustments in their therapies for, so for example, the diuretics, the antihypertensive um, agents, the antidiabetes medications, and the insulin regimens will all need to be adjusted well in advance um, of Ramadan in order to optimize them and allow them to fast safely during um, Ramadan. So to summarize then, Fasting during Ramadan with stable cardiovascular disease does not increase hospitalizations or worsening of the underlying heart condition. But further research is required for individuals with diabetes and pre-existing cardiovascular disease in order for us to make specific recommendations to such individuals. Studies investigating the risks of fasting on stroke seem to be conflicting and greater research is needed in these individuals with diabetes and pre-existing stroke. Fasting during Ramadan with stable CKD or those who've undergone a kidney transplant doesn't increase the EGFR or cause any, uh, but may cause uh, transient biochemical uh, changes. This may also apply to individuals with diabetes, but again, we also need to have um, more research on individuals with pre existing diabetes and CKD. So, as I've mentioned earlier, those who've had a kidney transplant and have got CKD between stages of three to five are at very high risk and should be discouraged. If they are going to undertake fasting, they need to have careful monitoring and specialized tailored advice much ahead of Ramadan. We are in need of larger prospective studies, um, including randomized control uh, trials that will assess the effect of fasting individuals with diabetes who have complications on both the micro and the macrovascular um, systems. And with that, I'd like to um, acknowledge all the colleagues who were involved in the pregnancy chapter of the guideline, in the chapter on fasting in the elderly, and on the chapter of CKD and cardiovascular disease. Um, thank you all for your attention, and I look forward to taking your questions and hear the references. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Khadija. I in now invite the co-speakers to open their cameras so that we can take um, whatever questions we have. We are a bit behind in time. In fact, we have consumed all our time, but nevertheless, it would be good to take a couple of questions um, from the attendees. Uh, please, if you have any burning questions, send them to, them, to us. So I invite um, um, our uh, co-speakers for uh, this uh, afternoon to open the cameras to take some questions. Um, okay, so there's a question for you, Dr. Uh, Ibrahim, um, uh, regarding the sulfonylureas. This, the, the, the person is asking, in Ramadan, is there a need to twitch, switch from glimepride to glyclozide? Okay, um, thank you for that question. Uh, well, we need to look at some of the attributes of the patient. I mentioned earlier on during my um, presentation that uh, glycolazide of all the other uh, sulfonylureas has a lower risk of hypoglycemia. So uh, if that patient, uh, you know, we think is at risk of uh, hy hypoglycemia, then it will be better to switch him uh, over to glycolazide uh, in order to maintain uh, the patient on glimepiride. Okay, um, I, I concur with this. We unfortunately we don't have head to head studies in Ramadan. We had head to head studies out of Ramadan, but during Ramadan we don't have head to head studies. Um, the guidelines have put them both at a good level. Glycolazide have plenty of data. Glimepiride have some data as well, and both are at. Uh, a reduced risk of hypoglycemia. Nazir, there's a question for you regarding the basal insulin. So are there modern uh, ultra-long acting insulins such as Glargine 300 and Deglodec better than the other basic um, long acting insulins? So would you recommend, uh, I mean, the, the, the person is asking what type would be better, the ultra-long or the long uh, uh, or the long-acting insulins only? So if we look at the uh, Orion study and the Rhizodec study, there is a suggestion that they would have lower risk of hypoglycemia with the ultra-long-acting insulins. Um, I mean, the Rhizodec is considered to have a bit more flexibility, so that may be an additional advantage for patients who are fasting in Ramadan. Uh, but for, the, for that patient who's able to fast and doesn't have a high hypoglycemic risk, there isn't a need to change them... Uh, it's, all patients don't need to be changed to ultra long acting insulins. I think it's for that patient a higher hypoglycemic risk uh, where that is a concern. Thank you, Nazir. It's just a, a small point that obviously the Rizodec was a, a, a background of Deglodec, but with Aspart. So um, we would love to have a long, uh, a basal insulin um, um, study on pure Deglodec that will be, uh, will give us more clarity. Uh, there was a question earlier um, by uh, somebody to uh, Dr. Gazawa. And the doctor was asking about the GI side effects of GLP-1 receptor agonists and if there were any special considerations during Ramadan. Perhaps we might want to address that? Yes. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I, I said in my presentation that uh, the GLP-1 receptor agonists uh, should not be commence very close to Ramadan. And one of the reasons is that we do know GLP-1 receptor agonists at the beginning may have uh, you know, some GI side effect, you know, nausea and uh, so on. And uh, we need to, uh, and that is usually a temporary, you know, after some time, you know, the, the patient ceases to have uh, that side effect. So that is why it is recommended that we stabilize the patient on the GLP-1 receptor agonist uh, long uh, before Ramadan. So, so there is consideration for that in terms of starting close to Ramadan because of that particular side effect. Thank you, Dr. Gizawa. There is a question to me regarding a patient on steroids causing hyperglycemia. I did answer on writing, but perhaps I can say the answer verbally as well. I think the guidelines will never be able to cater for all the clinical uh, scenarios. There's another question about the patient with TB. I think here you would need to, uh, to look into your own clinical judgment 
on whether the patient is sick enough to advise not to fast or whether the condition is stable. So someone on steroids that take, normally we take the steroids at 8 a.m. In your judgment, if they take it at 5 a.m., maybe at suhoor time, if that is considered to be a serious deviation, then I would advise the person not to fast and to uh, compensate in the future when maybe the person is off steroids. Uh, the other question about TB, we would not be able to ever cater for all of the aspects. Yourself, you need to exercise your clinical experience. I think in the, for the sake of time, I would like to thank all the faculty for this fantastic IDF workshop uh, in collaboration with DAR. Um, it's very, very informative.